What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of books that have come out this week. And also, we're going to be doing one of your requests. You had guys have been leaving us ratings and comments on iTunes requesting books. Our request this week is from CSASH. It's The Adventure Zone. Here there be Gerblins. We're going to yes. talk about that at the end of the show. If you'd like to request a book, again, just leave it in the ratings and comments on iTunes, and we will get to it. We love it. checking out whatever you guys want to ask. It's all good. But let's get into the new stuff first. Rogues, number one, from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Leo Max. This is our good friend Joshua Williamson trying yes. out the black label format for a tale of old man Captain Cold. As it goes yeah. on one last score along the Cold Man Max. Snart. Cold Man. Oh, that's good. What'd you think? Uh, what'd you guys think about this? I know you're not quite as into the Flash side of the universe, but did this work for you? Uh, I really think so. Uh, this really, w- I mean, the art's unbelievable, but this really had this kind of like Watchmen feel about it. I was really impressed with this. It feels epic. I'm glad that it's on the black label and can kind of get as dark as this story feels like it wants to get. Uh, I'm very excited about this. This is a fantastic first issue. Yeah, I like that it um, it pushes through a lot of the rogue stuff we've seen before. That uh, like people like Jeff Johns have really um, sort of built that pyramid um, in worship of them, and uh, pushes through into like this whole new type of story that I was really excited about. But I really want to highlight the art. It has this sort of almost like uh, classic. Uh, I'm trying to like sort of the, the wash on it is a little bit old, uh, and but it, it very expressive faces. It feels less superhero y, sort of a step out of that. Really like it. I'm gonna say the art to me, and I this is gonna sound derisive, but I really don't mean it as such. It's like elevated mad magazine, you know what I mean? Wow, okay, like it's kind of goofy looking, but a little more polished than that. And it, it's very fun. I had a good time reading this book. I like this take on the rogues. There's such sad sacks in this issue uh, that it comes off very fun. And the heist that they're pulling off without getting into any spoilers is very fun as well. and gets me excited for the second issue. So I think this is a great start. And particularly when a lot of the black label stuff does go very dark and very serious to have something that's a little lighter, a little more fun. I was super into let's also I, yeah. the fact that it is kind of like older, you know, we've seen like kind of like, you know, old Wolverine or these older things, but this is done in a way that uh, is different and kind of uh, there's a freshness to this, even though we've kind of seen something like this, it still feels uh, new and fresh, which is impressive. We have Demons, number one, from Dark Horse Comics, written by Scott Snyder, art by Greg Capullo. As you can probably tell from the team, this is a big reuniting of the team behind one of the most lauded Batman runs of all time here with an original property about a girl who is thrust into the middle of a battle between good and evil that slowly unfolds over the course of the first issue. Obviously we love the run on Batman, but how do you think this worked with an original property that doesn't have bats or a lot of men, to be honest, this is (laughs) bananas. Good. This was very enjoyable. Hell of a first issue. I love the, even the kind of set up preamble thing we get here. Uh, yeah, very, very impressed with this. Uh, can't say enough amazing stuff about the art. Uh, this is an another unbelievable first issue. Yeah, just I feel like you've been using the term bananas good a lot on the podcast lately. And I just want to rank it in like what that means. Does that mean like great? Or is it like, is this like a Runtz flavor profile where there's oh, bananas, I do love cherries. Runtz. I know you love Runtz because oh, Runtz is a candy. And also the banana flavor Runt is the best flavor. So that's yeah, how I, I knew you bananas were. Bananas good. I mean, it's, uh, it's really excellent. It's a high level uh, tier of. of do you fan, also fantastic. rate bananas that way? Do you like eat a banana and say this banana is bananas good? No, no, I don't. This banana is oranges ad- adequate. <laughs> confusing system stay away from pete in the grocery store and i mean that for a number of reasons uh i just because i assumed that you didn't mean actual bananas but banana runs really hits the mark is what you mean and i just want to give people that sort of visual uh, lexicon that. 
Um, as for this comic, um, this was, I feel like the, the opening page of text really set the tone. This feels unlike a lot of other Scott Snyder books. It almost feels like an early Rick Remender book. And the Greg Capullo art feels almost like an updated Rob Liefeld. Am I crazy? Well, like, Greg reveal... Capullo was a big 90s guy, like 90s, yeah. 2000s guy. And this feels like a throwback to that where it's like it's something that could have come out the same time as Spawn. And I don't think I would have blinked, you know? Exactly. Like, which Greg Capullo worked a lot on. Um, but it, with the reveal of the Gus character sort of late in the issue, I was like, this is a Rob Liefeld panel. <laughs> and but Pete, it, you seem to be so rattled you knocked your mic over what do you think about that? yeah i'm just very excited well it's weird you guys are throwing a lot of very specific things and i don't i don't want people to if they have bad kind of like uh memories of those projects to not latch onto this because it's its own thing and very good uh, you guys are trying to complement it uh i just you know when you say rifled i'm kind of like oh i don't know if, you know what i mean but uh i think this is extraordinary uh artwork and and is really fun character wise and even the small details of the weird um uh penis sculptures i mean everything is just really well done <laughs> weird highlight especially covering them pila page mm -hmm. i guess i would call this runts tastic <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to Wolverine patch number one from Marvel, written by Larry Hama, <laughs> art by Andrea DeVito. No, well, now, this on. is, I'm going to just throw it out here, the most important comic book of the week, particularly if you are having issues with your Wolverine. You're going to want to install this Wolverine patch immediately, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Pete, just go ahead and talk about what you liked about this book. All right, all right. first off, the legendary Larry Hama is on this, so... This is uh, number one for the ages. Um, one of my favorite kind of Wolverines here is Wolverine Patch. Um, you know, we don't, you know, usually we get kind of an adventure in the bar first, but um, uh, I am just excited and blown away. This is just like my inner geek child losing its mind. The fact that we're getting uh, Patch Wolverine right now. Uh, written by Larry Hama is just unfucking believable, and it delivers. This is fantastic. Uh, what a week for comics! What a time to be alive. Um, would you consider? I mean, first off, let me just say this is a Pete stack. There's yeah. so many books in this stack oh that I, we I haven't feel like the Ghost Cage yet. Yeah, well, I yeah, haven't gotten to Ghost Cage. There's like three other books in here. Uh, yeah. Venom uh, amongst them. I'm like, geez, we're Pete's taking the wheel here um but for this patch would you consider this more of like a nicotine patch or like a weeblows patch um oh come on man i mean this is this is a zeppelin all the way across your fucking jean jacket patch bro this is fucking wow. real deal. all across the back yeah. this is like classic if you're not like alex said earlier if your flavor of wolverine is not life and death many lives and deaths like this is what you want because this is like over the plate, classic Wolverine, yeah. spotting Soviet planes from the sky, falling and messing up his body <laughs> in a way that uh, he's like, bones don't break. And I was like, wow, bones don't break. Is he just throwing his joints out all over? The yeah, place? that never occurred to me. I guess his muscles rip and stuff. He could just be a Does loose it... bag of bones, just rattling yeah. around in there for a while. Yeah. You know? Uh, reading this Do you book, think I was some like, of his cartilage? <laughs> you think some of his cartilage is co coated in adamantium? They slipped, like they slipped a little bit when they were coating his bones. Like got like a he little heals. bit what of his ligaments. What the fuck is your problem, guys? Does he? I'm not familiar with this Wolverine character. Oh what God. about his teeth? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I read this book cool. and I was like, "Who is this book for?" And then I thought a minute later, "Oh, for Pete." Yeah. So there you go. Ghost well, you, Gage. You guys didn't. You're not having a great time with this. This is yeah, it's good. This is fine. Here's Classic. the thing: this okay. is a good job from the writing and art team. Exactly what I'd expect from this book, so they delivered on that. But I feel like comics have moved on, and I'm okay with it. Okay, but you can't just go back to a place and be like, "Hey, remember this? We're doing that." Again. Clearly, some people need to, and I'm not saying that derisively. Or more than I used before, <laughs> oh, careful. But... <laughs> Careful. Not me. Not me. Yeah. Always forward, I say. Always forward. Yeah, like I sometimes go back and ride my bicycle with training wheels on it. <laughs> just and to it's get fun. feel for it again. It's fun. Yeah, exactly. Just be like, I remember this. I'm perfectly safe. 
Ghost Cage, number one from Image Comics, written by Nick Dragota and Caleb Golner, art by Nick Dragota. This is the artist of East of West doing a wild anime manga style story about a being robot, not entirely clear, that's thrust inside a massive facility, has to fight his way to the top. Again, Pete, you love this one. Talk about what you liked about this. Yeah, this is just really <laughs> you were really about to say it. you were gonna say bananas good and then bananas you stopped yourself good. I did not. I was not. no i was bananas not. good no bananas. this is just like plantains good <laughs> fun over the top kind of anime uh like characters action the black and white is great it's got such a cool feel and tone it's very imaginative it's very like fuck you big corporations this is great this is very cool and like you can kind of relate to the character who's kind of thrust in here as the it tech support and uh it's just super tripped out in all the right ways um yeah i this is just absolutely fantastic i mean this is just quality art and comics meeting in this wonderful place and wow this is good um, I'm a big fan of East of West, the comic that Nick Dragota wrote, or sorry, Drew, that Jonathan Hickman wrote. Um, and so this was fun. It's a very similar art style, um, uh, which was cool. And but it's also the different. Ca- it's also different. Um, it's much less dense, I feel like. It's a little bit more like, um, here are these characters go. Uh, you don't quite know what's happening for some of it. But you know that your um, main character and uh, is fighting a bunch of different people that are expertly drawn. Um, I feel like the little floating ghosts remind me of Clippy from Microsoft Word. Oh, how dare you, man! That ghost was not as annoying as Clippy is. That's... Clippy is an icon. Man. Clippy's helpful. Yeah. Clippy is not either of those things. Why he's fixing your words? Yeah. Well, looks like you're trying to write a document, Pete. Go fuck yourself, <laughs> Clippy. I thought Another this book was really spelling good. mistake, Pete. <laughs> Try Pete, again. This <laughs> this <laughs> document's bananas good. <laughs> Diary is a hard word to spell. What, you want me to you want me to just drop it in? No. Let Clippy help you. <laughs> Ghost Change is really good. This is a creative, fun comic book that is pretty much nonstop fights. Yeah. Moving on to The Human Target, number six from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Greg Smallwood. In this issue, a lot of things that have been simmering below the surface come onto the surface here. As the mm. relationship between Ice and the Human Target heats up about halfway through his life expectancy, leading to a shocking, shocking ending here that I could not believe. And the entire time thought was not real. Maybe we'll get into spoilers. So if you don't want to know, don't listen. Uh, But what do you guys think about this one? Well, here's what I I, I will non-spoilery talk about it. First off, this is one of the best books on the stands. It's beautifully drawn. It's just a great (laughs) sort of crime story. The romance between the human target and ice is so great. It's dangerous. It's sexy. It's exciting. I love it. And then the death happens. The murder happens here. Um, and what I love about it is it raises the stake for the whole story. Reading this story up until this point, you're like, oh, he's going to find his way out of this. He's going to survive this poison because of course he is. He's the hero. But with this death, I think we've deviated from continuity and it makes it like, oh, wait, he might not make it out of here alive. And it just raises the stakes on the whole story in such an awesome way. Pete? Yeah, I think this... it continues to be amazing. The art's unbelievable. Uh, I mean, I was very excited about uh, what happened and how it went down. I, you know, I've wanted to do that to that character for a long time, so <laughs> I thought it was really badass and a great example of what fun you can have with a black label uh, type comic. This is really good stuff. Definitely check it out. Next up, Count Crawley, number one from Dark Horse Comics, written by David Dalmatian, art by Lucas Kettner. This is, I believe, picking up on a previous comic that David Dalmatian did. I believe we talked about on the show, if I remember correctly, about a old timey horror show host who ends up fighting evil in his spare time. Here, I believe his granddaughter is picking up on it and also fighting evil and trying to stop vampires and werewolves and other things. So it's a little bit goofy. It's a little bit intense. Uh, what do you guys think about this first issue? 
yeah, we kind of get a Tales from the Crypt kind of intro thing. That's a lot of yeah. fun. Uh, this is uh, unbelievable art. Really badass. Love all the kind of fighting and action. Uh, yeah, this was this was great. I love this. This was a great package. This reminds me of like a lost '90s show that would air on like CBS After Dark. Was that what it was? Or or USA Up All Night? Anybody watch Johnny Bago? Uh, it sounds vaguely familiar. Um, anyway, there used to be this sort of block of entertainment that were like. Are you of thinking like, of Silk Stockings? Silk, Silk Stock- Stockings, I think, was part of that. This whole oeuvre sure. of programming. Red um, Shoe Diaries? What the no, fuck? not pornography. <laughs> this is right at the edge. There was like main network television versions of that. Johnny Bago was a guy who were, caused trouble and drove around in a Winnebago. It's out there. Um, but what I'm saying is like this feels like something was his name that is... Natu- like, sorry, was his name naturally Johnny Bago or did he take it after the Winnebago? That's a great question. Honestly, I don't remember a lot of the, the intense backstory to this like fairly stupid um hour long show yeah. uh, you were um, you know like a little too much of the pornography it was what there's no this is not a pornographic television <laughs> okay i'm looking if it was on the same up. block as silk stockings and red shoe diaries i know it's think something it's else not. is going on there hold on i'm looking up johnny bago anyway this book feels <laughs> like <laughs> that um i'm looking up johnny bago uh it feels like that type <laughs> of uh pilot for a show Mm -hmm. um it does all the work we set up sort of all the creepy backstory it has that sort of 90s feel johnny bago aired on cbs from june 25th 1993 to july 30th 1993 (laughs) so it's so surprising that we don't remember that yeah i didn't get how did i see this yeah how did i see this it was on for 15 seconds it made a huge Uh, impression in your life Wow. Well, you know who is an EP on it? Robert Zemeckis. Oh, okay. Um, so don't you dare. I can't believe I After know Johnny is. Bago felt, he started working on The Polar Express. Oh, boy. Directed. The pilot was directed by Robert Zemeckis. Imagine this that. This is great. <laughs> Not you know, a if I'm the na- creative team name. of Count Crawley, do you know what I'm doing right now? Enjoying this review. <laughs> I was. This is a positive review. I guess I thought Johnny Bago was a little bit more ubiquitous than it actually is. It aired for one month if in 1993. Stop talking about Johnny Bago and talk about the book a little bit. I'd be more more happy. Yeah. Um, I like this book. I was trying to draw a nice analogy, and I guess all I could say is go Johnny Bago. <laughs> that was his catchphrase. Uh, we should do a Johnny Bago podcast that's slightly related to this. Let's move on to talk about Venom Lethal Protector number one from Marvel, written by David Michelini, art by even Ivan Fiorello. I'll turn this also over to Pete. <laughs> I mean, this is great. This is just a, you know, classic, over-the-top, fun Venom book where he's kind of a little bit like Hulk and misunderstood and then is doing uh, gross, hilarious stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, I love this. The whole humbug uh, thing was hysterical. Uh, this was, I think, like a classic great Venom book. Uh, yeah, this was... Banana Justin? What did, you, what did you say? Did you finish that sentence? <laughs> I said banana's good. <laughs> oh, you're you're sad about using your uh, your fa- fantastic catchphrase. Um, this I I feel like this book came out of the fact that there's a semi popular Venom movie that is still like airing um, that you can maybe watch on a device in your very own home tonight even, and the Venom stories in ma- main Marvel comics are wildly different than anything happening, and this feels like it's much more over the plate for the Venom movies. And does feel, they do a good job of making this feel like a classic 90s comic. Yeah. Agreed. Next up, Armor Clads, number one from Valiant, written by J.J. O'Connor and Brian Bucciolato, art by Manuel Garcia. In this, this takes place in the far space of the Valiant universe as a bunch of miners fight a alien infestation. Might remind you a little bit of a movie that I'm thinking of called... Could be two movies. Could be a bunch of movies. Alien. Starship Troopers. Oh, Starship Troopers, also that. Uh, But yeah, that's going on there. I'll tell you what, though. Big thing for me off of this book was like, oh, yeah, Valiant. I forgot about that. 
it felt like they've gone away for a big chunk of time. And as they plug at the end of this book, they're trying to come back in a big way with rebooting a lot of their classic titles once again. So I'm excited to see that. I'm always rooting for them. But how do you feel about this as a new number one? Did this work? The Arbinger title, I think um, we've really been lucky. So it feels like they are making a nice stab here. This one does feel a little, it feels far away from the rest of the Valiant universe. It's sort of like carving out something totally new, um, which is fine. Um, but I guess it, I got a little caught up in the references that we were making about Alien and uh, Starship Troopers. It felt like a real homage combination of those two movies. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the kind of um, this kind of classic story set up here it's 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 a great number one as far as like kind of we understand what's going on kind of waiting for kind of things to get kind of bigger and 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 but as far as like number one goes it's setting up this world getting you excited for what's to come i think it does a good job <laughs> Can I throw out a really, really stupid comment to you guys? So, as usual, yes. Here we go. So, everybody in this comic book were introduced to a bunch of different characters. They all have the same armor, which logically makes sense. There would be no reason for everybody to have different armor if they're all working as miners. But yeah. there's something very simple about, like, oh, that's Sam. He has the drill. And this is jessica mm. and she has the saw that i felt like was kind of missing here in this book just oh, in terms of differentiating the characters so that that's alex he has the podcasting equipment exactly that's p he just has one. bumper stickers on his bare skin <laughs> and covered in bananas just standing on a pile of bananas uh, yeah, so I was missing that a little bit, but otherwise I thought the art was solid. It was good. I am curious to see the Archer and Armstrong book that's coming out and other yeah. things. So hopefully Valiant's making it back. Action Comics, number 1041 from DC Comics, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, Sean Aldridge, art by Dale Eaglesham and Will Conrad and Adrian Mello. This is showing what's been going on with Midnighter while everybody else has been imprisoned on Mongols War World, and in the backup story, we got Martian Manhunter fighting, I think, the Court of Owls, but maybe it's not the Court yeah, of it Owls. It's just, like it's... it's just some people wearing very similar masks. Yeah. Uh, so that stuff is going on. Uh, first of all, Dale Eaglesham on this sort of book, killer. Love it. Yeah. So good. Yeah, um, I... I think this, this issue really affirms what a great choice Midnighter is to be the sort of other hero. I feel like it could have very easily have been Batman. And Midnighter is such a more interesting choice and a better fit here. Um, I love the uh, backup cover of all the four Superman from the death of Superman and sort of the way that spins into the legend building and uh, discussion that these characters are having on the war world. Uh, yeah, this is intense. Uh, I, I love this. I, I kind of like this whole war world thing. I love the kind of reveal of super, Superman in this issue, uh, and then Midnighter kind of being like blue. Like I, I, I just think this is really badass and very enjoyable. And uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson is killing it right now with this. And the backup kind of reminds me of that. Um, oh my God, why am I blanking? Al Ewing kind of Hulk run kind of gruesomeness a little bit. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, tight package. All right, next up, Stranger Things Kachaka, number one from Dark Horse Comics, written by Michael Morsey, art by Todor Hristov. This is not teeing up what's been going on with Hopper in Russia, but it is showing a little bit of the world in Russia and the lab out there tying into the world of Stranger Things. Here, a scientist is presented with a Demogorgon, seems to refuse to work with the Demogorgon to help Russia bring through perhaps more of them, and two kids get worked in. I know we've talked around a lot of these Stranger Things books. I think this is one of the best ones, and I think, honestly, this almost did a better job of fleshing out the mythology of the world of Stranger Things than the show Stranger Things does. What?! I felt wow. the same way. Like, reading this, I was like, yes, this is the kind of book that I want to see building out the Stranger Things universe, as opposed to other side quests with the kids that we know sort of aren't going to play into the series. This book, I'm like, yes, this is actually deepening some of the story, creating a new set of characters. They're having their own battle um, against the Demogorgon. Like, 
I really like this. Uh, good art and uh, just I, I'm so glad they didn't go into any uh, Russian backstory for um, for what's his name, the cop. Uh, I I agree with you guys that this is an amazing book. I'm not going to say something like it's better than Stranger Things, but like uh, I, I be, had that would be a, crazy. I had such a blast with this and I felt like they did such a great job of setting up the world, explaining what's going on. And like it really, uh, we got a lot in this issue, and I felt like I understood what was going on, even though it was so intense. Uh, yeah, the art's fantastic. This is some great storytelling. Uh, a must pick up if you love Stranger Things. This is cool. This is banana must. waffles good. Banana waffles good. Yeah. Detective Comics number one thousand and fifty eight from DC Comics, written by Mariko Tamaki and Matthew Rosenberg, art by Amon K. Napoleon. And Fernando Blanco in the front Blanco. story, we are wrapping up the tale of a attacked Arkham Tower and kicking things off into the next phase, as well as teeing up the next mystery that Batman is going to follow in the title. And the backstory is wrapping up the story of this kid oh who's grown up throughout the entire oh history of God. Gotham in an absolutely tragic manner. I think we've been loving both of these stories. What did we think about the final chapters? This uh this is just unbelievable i mean the the backup story almost became better than the main story but the main story was just so good i was you you want to talk about a total package this is unbelievable this has been such a great ride uh this heartbreaking kind of story of a kid growing up in gotham and how that affects him this was so amazing i i am so impressed with uh the both the both these stories uh, this has been such a great, uh, great comic to to kind of pick up and great place to kind of jump in with uh, Batman and everything that's going on. Uh, yeah, I feel like uh, both of these stories have been some of the most reliable, good comic storytelling coming out. And yeah. especially the fact that they're doing it on a weekly basis is yeah. so great. And I wish this was just continuing on like uh, more and more of this because. I think the main story, like I, I sort of said this last time, where it we built up Batman on his arrival, and here we get these huge, huge page splash, splash pages um, with the fight. This is one of the best spoiler storylines we've had in a long time. Uh, so really enjoyed the front story and the back story. Answer that question about like what's it like to really grow up under uh, with Batman and Joker and all the supervillains sort of doing their thing in Gotham, and it's. About as depressing as you might expect, but uh, really great. But so well done, though. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great story. I would say that I liked how the backup story wrapped up better than the front story. The front story, just this issue, felt a little quick to me. Like, I felt like there needed to be one more issue going on here. I was surprised how quickly and neatly it wrapped up. But at the same time, like you guys are saying... This has been a phenomenal run. Very excited to see what happens next in this title. Next up, Bolero, number three from Image Comics, written by Wyatt Kennedy, art by Luana Vecchio. In this issue, we're continuing to follow our main character who has been jumping through different lives. She has finally found an alternate universe life that she absolutely loves before. Spoiler here, I guess, but she kind of messes it up. There's a big big twist at the end of this issue that personally I did not see coming, but I really love the character studies that are going on in this book. They continue to go in very deep and very interesting and very true and often very messy ways that I appreciate. This is one of those uh, rare books that really uses the premise as a way of exploring the characters as opposed to the vice versa of that, of using um, the characters to explore premise. And I, I really enjoyed, I think the art's great. Um, and it feels like this issue really crystallized that it's a metaphor for like dating and relationships. Um, a great like science fiction, uh, multiversal metaphor for that, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, it's very uh, creative, enjoyable, continues to be an, an impressive book. And you it's, love the nudity, sex. right, Pete? You love the nudity and the you, sex? You, you, I was trying to be above you know, your pervy picks here, but if you're going to fucking do it, then let's do it. All right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's using artistic nudity, but still 
a little too pervy for my taste. Uh, but you know, it's it's like the sort. Let's just say it's the sort of comic thing. book that would be on the same block as Johnny Bago, right? <laughs> Johnny Bago is not. It's a comedy. Robert Zemeckis, Cook Mr. Clean. I mean, you're doing... the one who said it was paired with silk stockings, but whatever. I did. <laughs> Aquaman. Honestly, never... I think what happened is it was they didn't know one liked it, so they buried it at like eleven thirty or twelve thirty on a on a, a Thursday night, which USA. is when I was yeah. also but prime Selvin, viewing you for your the boy one JT. Who brought up silk stockings. Justin did not. Uh, okay, continuity expert. <laughs> what are you a cop? Come on, <laughs> soft core cop. I uh, uh, couldn't ho- help but notice you mentioned you were the one that mentioned <laughs> silk stockings, damn. <laughs> Aquaman number two from DC Comics, written by Chuck Brown and Brandon Thomas, art by Sammy Bosry. In this issue, we're picking up on the big cliffhanger from the end of the last issue that turns out Aquaman, the original Aquaman, Arthur Curry, is teaming up with his arch enemy, Black Manta, and the new Aquaman is not a big fan of that. Things go down in this issue. We get a lot of big stuff happening. What'd you guys feel about it? I thought this was awesome. Um, I, I love the uh, the kind of like new Aquaman kind of losing his cool a little bit. Um, I I love this kind of like uh, uh, building up uh, a steam of momentum that the story is doing. The, the art's really solid, classic kind of DC feel. And I love the fact that Aquaman and Black Manta are teaming up for once. And I like this new direction that they're going in this book. This is very exciting, and I think they're doing it really well. Uh, like a lot of the DC legacy heroes, it's a little convoluted. Like with this, we have Aquaman. We have Aqu- also Aquaman. We have Garth, who used to be Aqualad, and he's sort of a magician. Um, we got Orm down here. It's just it's a little bit uh, hard to <laughs> sift through. Uh, but I do think this issue... I really like the new Aquaman. I think he is like brash and angry in a way. He almost reminds me of Namor a little Mm -hmm. bit. Um, The the Submariner. Yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking about. You know, from Marvel Comics. Not familiar. You lost me. You you had me for a bit. Uh, I think they also publish um, Patch, (laughs) the Patch comic, number one. Oh, great. I need to get that for my computer. It's been really buggy lately. Uh, anyway, I like this new character. I like that he is a little bit reckless, a little bit angrier. Agreed. Next up, The Department of Truth, number 17 from Image Comics, written by James Tide of the Fourth, art by Jorge Fornes. In this issue, we're flashing back in time and showing what happened with the beginnings of The Department of Truth and specifically what happened during the Nixon presidency that changed everything. I'll tell you what. This was my favorite issue of the Department of Truth in a good long while. And I think that's down to not just Jorge Fortas' incredible art in this issue, but also James Tynan writing towards Jorge Fortas' art and the spareness of it that I thought was awesome. Loved it. Well, what's interesting is like we're 17 issues deep and then we're finally kind of getting the explanation of uh, the Department of Truth and what's going on. I would have... I feel like if we would have had this maybe a little or I mean I you know the writing on this is phenomenal and this is such a creative book but like just somebody sitting down and kind of explaining this a little bit really felt great and it was like I, I don't know I wanted it a little sooner uh, but yeah this continues to be such a creative fantastic book. Um, I love this book, and I think, Alex, I think what you're responding to here is it is a little bit of a cleaner story and a cleaner art style, so it makes for just, like, a more understandable story, uh, especially just, like, a lot of the setting up that was happening. I feel like this book is always, like, reestablishing its premise because it's sort of a big idea, so they have to keep using these sort of more specific ways that it was built up, and this was, I think, the most clear version of it. Yeah, I think that definitely gets towards it. But as always, this title is very, very good. Next up, Black Hammer Reborn, number 10, excuse me, from Dark Horse Comics, written by Jeff Lemire, art by Caitlin Yarsky. This issue, after the big revelation that our villain is the original Black Hammer, or at least one from an alternate universe, here we get a bunch of big fight scenes, things going down, and a great cliffhanger here that brings in some other characters from the Black Hammer universe. 
man, this series is so good and it just goes for it. Yeah, I'm uh, I mean, I agree. I I'm constantly impressed by this book and I agree. Like sometimes you just got to punch your dad with a hammer, you know what I mean? Dads are the worst. They don't I wouldn't understand. recommend that. I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, it seems uh, like that's what they're saying this book is and you both love it. So you're definitely uh, saying it's okay to do that. Real quick, this is totally unrelated, but I just took the last sound bite that you said, Pete, and I sent it to the police, just in case. You know, your friends, the police, since yeah, you're a cop. good friends. Oh, no, no, let's not. Good friends. Let's, let's be cool. Um, I, let's be cool. Um, I uh, I like this a lot, too. It feels like um, it reminds me of when I was a kid and um, just you, creating yeah, a bunch of characters on my own. Having it more touch with hammers in general, MC Hammer. Huh. Great. Uh, I guess we're not talking about that book. Uh, clear number five. <laughs> to say more. <laughs> clear number five from Comicsology Originals, written once again by Scott Snyder, art by Scott, Francis Madison. This guy's out there. This takes place in a world that's been taken over, as far as I understand it, by some sort of virtual reality utopia. Of course, it's not at all that it's cracked up to be. The real hero of this book for me is Francis Matipole's art, which is absolutely yeah. gorgeous. Love the stuff. Just love looking at it throughout as the various characters walk through these landscapes. What about you guys? Yeah, I yeah. agree with you. This story has been, a. it feels like it's one of those stories that's constantly... Um, explaining itself again like what a veil is um what it does why one veil is good is bad for most people but uh, many veils is good or the plan is like switching that sort of expectation there um uh, but i do i do like the 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 world that's been built here especially because of the art like you said i yeah i mean the art is absolutely gorgeous so so great but I mean, we shouldn't take away from scott's writing this is such a creative cool world loved the kind of way the different ways that we kind of saw this character uh like as a spider in different kind of panels and through different uh, uh shots that bled into different panels it's just such creative amazing stuff um yeah i as far as like we read a lot of comics but the way this was kind of like all just set up and unfolds it's such a great kind of example of how you can kind of uh, lead with story and we will follow. It's uh, it's so weird and different and cool. Uh, yeah, I was very impressed with it. My bad. Number yes, five. Was, That's, oh, yes. Oh, sorry, no, this is the name sorry. of the comic sorry. book from I, Ahoy my mistake, Comics. My mistake. I've been waiting for that apology for a long time. <laughs> Written by Mark Russell and Bryce Ingham. Art by Peter Krause and Joe Orsak. Now, this book is a satirical look at superhero comics. And in this issue, the chandelier finally makes good on the tease for the first issue where he was sent a salad shooter. I believe it's a salad shooter, right? Yeah, by his salad. arch enemy. Uh, we get the reveal of a why that was said in this issue but this is just so much fun so goofy mark russell is so good with the satire peter krause's art is great i just had a blast reading this book i'm sad it's over but it was such a fun five issues what did you guys think also the really fun backup stuff with all the old kind of like order the toy kind of stuff uh, the magic hole uh, send a dollar to anywhere but here toys i are just like really hilarious very creative the dying inside book i i just uh yeah the it's worth it alone just for the fun kind of cool stuff in the back but yeah all, the comic is very creative unbelievably uh done uh, it's, it's a fantastic package I feel like Ahoy Comics does a great job of really fleshing out their worlds and like building in all this extra back matter that is really interesting and, and helps to really make it feel like you're getting so much uh, for what you're paying for. And as for the main story, like I like this as well. And I actually thought it is great satire, great comedy, but it's also like a good scam. They, the mm -hmm. chandelier got duped. It was a great scam. It was a great, great reveal at the end there. Very fun. Last one we're going to talk about is The Adventure Zone. Here there be Gerblins from First Second, written by Clint McElroy and Carrie Petch. Art by Carrie Petch. This is requested by CSASH, as mentioned on iTunes. Thank yes. you, CSASH, for recommending it. Now, this is based on the podcast 
by the McElroys. Pretty weird that it wasn't something based on our podcast, but I guess we'll let yeah. it slide. That said, this is a classic D&D style adventure that a bunch of folks are going on. What you guys think about this book? Well, I really thought it was um, a fun way to kind of break the fourth wall with this yes. kind of DM uh, 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 character doing that. And uh, I thought, like, we've seen a bunch of kind of like, all right, we're going to kind of bring this uh, D&D board game to life. But uh, it was it's the art's fantastic and it's uh, it's quirky and fun enough. So it, it brings some originality to it. Uh, yeah, I thought it was enjoyable. Yeah, I feel like the real innovation here is that turning to the dungeon master throughout the book mm-hmm. and uh, being able to in the and uh, all the comedy and like I don't listen to the adventure zone, but you still pick up the story, you get the world you're in. Um, but the fun to be had is really uh, turning outward in a uh, Parker Lewis can't lose, also a television show oh, uh, yeah. from the '90s uh, style way that lets you um, or Z- uh, Zach Morris calling timeouts in early seasons of Saved by the Bell. I'm not familiar with the Saved by the Bell thing, but I, I do know oh. Parker Lewis. That was paired with uh, Red Shoe Diaries, right? <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> what are we, we're reviewing next week Red Shoe Diaries number one, written by Alex Zalman, drawn by photos Albin, Alex Zalman took. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to confess something here, because I think this was good. The art was fun. I agree with you on the DM thing. I think that was a very, very fun device throw in here but there's this weird uh, maybe where there's the wrong word there is this sub genre of comic books now that are based on podcasts where people play D D, and it yes. is just not my thing like i i already kind of can't get into like there's already a block for me a little bit with D D, and that's probably where it comes from mm-hmm. but then i probably wouldn't listen to a podcast about D and then to read a comic book about a podcast about D D is just too many steps removed this is not a valid criticism mind you i'm very well aware of that <laughs> because uh, if you already like the podcast if you already like D and i think this is probably perfectly within your wellhouse and you're gonna have a great time reading this book and it's gonna be super fun but given that there's this there's also a critical role there's at least one other one that i'm not thinking of uh vox machina is the same thing as critical role right oh is it i thought it was different yeah i don't know uh but there's at least one other one as well oh there was the the space one as well the one that felicia day is on that i'm blanking oh yeah uh but it is the subgenre and they feel like kind of shaggy to me is the problem, which, mind you, we have talked about bananas good over the course of our podcast, so it's fine, and I know my criticism holds no water. But that's the main thing that, like, removes me a little bit from this book. But otherwise, for what it is, I think it was very well created. Well, let me say, and what I think it is, is it's a little, they're a little winky. They're inherently Mm -hmm. like, look, we made this for you, the fans. Mm -hmm. It's not about necessarily reaching out to a larger audience. I'm sure that's partially the goal. But it's really made for people who are already consuming the content on the podcast. So it's very much like, look, we're doing the thing. Hey, look at this other thing that we do that we you might not notice, but it's sort of an Easter egg. It's like if we had a a comic and we talked about um, Johnny Bago a bunch, (laughs) people would be like, a new reader or a new listener <laughs> would be like, what, what the fuck are these guys talking about? Yeah. But the true fans would be like, they're doing the Johnny Bago thing. Exactly. Classic Johnny Bago bit. Well, uh, my main impression, and I'll, I'll throw that out here, this is just if anybody else does read this and are like, eh, I don't quite get this, this isn't quite for me. The entire time I was kind of like, I wish I was rather... I wish I was reading Skull Kickers, which is this book by Jim uh, Zub. Great. Which... Comic is also like playing off of D&D conventions, but so fun, gets like very dark at points and very deep with the characters that I really enjoy. So not to recommend something off of this review we're doing, but that was definitely my impression here. I was like, of this thing, of D&D things, we talked about Jim Dub's other D&D stuff too, which is also really good. Like I think... He is a writer, and this is not to slag off these writers, because, again, I think they do a perfectly fine job here, but he is a writer who really gets to do what you're talking about, Justin, which is take a D&D thing that does not work for everybody and make it work for a general audience. So 
If you do like this, that might be a great jumping off point for something else you could read. If you didn't like this, maybe you want to check that out. I don't know. But while we're talking about criticism, I think it's important to talk about, like, you know, if we do get someone writing into iTunes and they recommend something we don't want to read, do we still have to read that? You know what yes. I mean? And it's just the answer is things, yes. Like, yes. The answer just is clearly why, yes. yes. Totally why, unrelated. Next week on the podcast, we'll be reviewing Spider Man Raid, which was another Spider Man Raid. Spider Man Raid. We don't all read it if we don't. You know what I mean? Like maybe Spider Raid. <laughs> Spider Ray. <laughs> I checked like the, the I checked the weather time, forecast. I checked the weather forecast again. and next week is calling for rain, Pete. I don't want to read it again. It's a really nice tie in to the fact that we're literally going to have a spider raid here on the East Coast. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's true. That's a per- it's a great point, Alex. We're tying Thank in you. it's topical it's topical comic news. <laughs> <laughs> topical comic read. news. Just because somebody says something nice, which is very appreciated doesn't mean that we then have to revisit something for our Here's past the thing. We... We're like genies. Somebody says something nice on iTunes, we're trapped, man. We're exactly. trapped. Exactly. Uh, how about this, Pete? Why don't we just record re- your review now? You can say it's bananas good and the art <laughs> was, was the tight package. I'm not going to say that. And Justin, you I can say it, it reminds you of Johnny Bingo. <laughs> well, we got plenty of that. I think I said that for every comic this week. C-Sash, really, thank you for recommending this comic. We appreciate it. Sorry if we went far afield. And again, if any of you want to recommend a comic, just drop a ratings and a comment over on iTunes. If you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube coming out. We would love to chat with you about comic books. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and Follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. Go, Johnny Bago! Go, Johnny Bago!